Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Conversation for Our Generation, where we are solving the problems of today with the wisdom of the past. My name is Nick Jamel, the creator and the host of the Conversation for Our Generation. And today I have a special episode for you where I interview Brendan Lane from the Catholic History Show to talk about some of the myths that are out there about Catholic history, about Christopher Columbus, about the Inquisition or the Crusades, and some of the problems that we have with the way we understand that time in history. And I think it's a really great conversation. I think I learned a lot for sure. And I think a lot of people out there will on really how this may have, a lot of these things may have just gotten muffled and changed and confused in our history classes because we have a very anti-Catholic country in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of vested interest in pushing back against the church from not just secularists, but a lot of Protestants as well have throughout history wanted to push back against the church. And so we talk a lot about those issues and where people go wrong and what's right, really. Uh, So that hopefully that's valuable to you and interesting as well, because I think there's, we just need to know our history. I think that that's an important thing that we lose track of. And I think Brendan is out there doing a great job of keeping that on track for people. So definitely he has a YouTube channel, just search Catholic History Show and you'll find him. Or you can find him on Twitter at Crucivon, C-R-U-C-I-S-W-O-O-D. You can check him out there. There's links in the show notes as well. And just a reminder that you can check out the Conversation of Our Generation at conversationofourgeneration.com. Go to the podcast tab to see wherever the podcast is being recorded. If you're listening right now, leave a good rating and review because I really appreciate that. Definitely, we have a YouTube channel opening up. You can search that. You can go to Twitter at Call of Our Gen to follow me. Lots of great stuff happening there. Or on Facebook.com slash Conversation for Our Generation to keep up with the latest on the Conversation for Our Generation. And so with that, I'm going to hop on over to the interview. Hey, Brendan, thanks for coming on today to the Conversation for Our Generation. I appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Awesome. And so do you want to give me a little bit about you and what you're doing over at the Catholic History Show? Sure. Um, Like I said, my name is Brendan. Um, 2008 to 2014, I was in the U.S. Navy. Uh, And during that time, I reverted to the Catholic faith. And one of the major driving forces uh, in that reversion was actually, um, I've always been interested in history. I've always uh, really enjoyed learning more about uh, historical narratives. And it was actually the history of the church that was a major driving force for me back into the Catholic church. And so um, as I was reverting, I realized that there really wasn't a lot of material out there, specifically like a YouTube channel specifically dedicated to Catholic history. Um, and so I kind of wanted to do that. That was back in, I think, 2015, uh, when I started the channel. And it's a tiny channel. It's not very big. Um, but I started when I was at school after the Navy, I got out, I uh, went to Franciscan, I studied theology and finance. And then, uh, I, while I was there, I, I started making these videos and, um, I got, I got some, um, I guess I can talk a little bit later about some of the feedback I got. Um, but I got a lot of positive feedback from Catholics. Uh, so, you know, I continue to do that, but then, you know, things come up in life. So they they became more and more sporadic. And then anyways, after I left Franciscan, I, uh, I uh, became a teacher at a, uh, a classical school in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, and it was actually the videos that I created on YouTube that got me the job. It's how I got on their radar. They reached out to me. Uh, we had a meeting and I said I was, you know, obviously dedicated to teaching theology. So um, when I went, when I was a teacher, I taught theology for high school um, and church history. Um, and so while I was there, I continued to make videos. Um, and then I eventually uh, met my, who is now my wife. Um, and uh, we got married and I moved out uh, into Western Virginia. And I, uh, you know, I, I stopped teaching because I couldn't uh, find a position in teaching. And, uh, you know, I've kind of shifted careers, but I still continue to make videos because of, of just how much I enjoyed doing it. And uh, a lot of the positive feedback actually, I guess I can talk about it right now. It's actually a lot of the negative feedback that really drives me. I get a ton of negative feedback from uh, Protestants. And um, actually, my tagline for the show now is, uh, you know, Protestants probably do not love this show because 
uh, I've just gotten so much um, negative feedback. But I thought, you know what? Um, I'm Catholic, and I, I love being Catholic. Um, and I'm, and I'm in, in a way, obviously not in a negative way, but in a good way, proud to be Catholic. And I think we should, should uh, you know, tell the great stories from the church's past. And I, I want to make a distinction here, too. The, the Catholic History Show is specifically uh, Catholic history. It's not necessarily church history. Obviously, those things intertwine. But I kind of focus more on how the church um, is seen from a larger perspective. So I don't, obviously, councils and things like that, I talk about them. But I, I try to stay away from theology because I don't have a doctorate in theology. And obviously, going to study theology at Franciscan, I realized just how um, complicated it, is probably the right word. And obviously, there's a, there's a I, it's not saturated, but there's a huge market already out there filled with people making um, Catholic theology videos. So that wasn't really what I wanted to do. So the Catholic History Show really focuses on, um, you know, kind of uh, more sociopolitical plus how the church interacted in that way. So anyways, that's kind of who I am. And that's what the Catholic History Show is all about. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I think, you know, you're probably, I'm sure you get a lot of negative feedback from Protestants, but I'm sure that there's probably a lot of uh, positive stuff from people. Oh, yes. Yeah. I get plenty I, of, I mean, just wonderful people reaching out to me and thanking me and, and giving me ideas and, you know, telling me if they, you know, like they like something or they wish it was phrased a different way. Or, and so, yeah, I have, I mean, there's a really wonderful community out there of people that are really supporting me. So I'm very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, I, I like that a lot. And I think that it's good to, with how much the church was instrumental and in really about 2000 years of European, Eastern, you know, like the Middle East, North African history. I mean, they're totally intertwined. And so you really can't have the history of the West, at least in that in the last 2000 years without looking into the Catholic church. So, and how no. it into that. So no, it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. And the other thing I've realized too, is that in the United States of America, uh, we kind of have a stunted historical perspective specifically because, you know, we really start our history at 1776. So we don't get to see the buildup of Christendom. I mean, Christendom is in its waning, year, waning years at that point. You know, we have had the religious wars after the Protestant Reformation. So we don't really get to see the, the, the culmination of Christendom um, in the way that, you know, maybe Europeans get to see it. So I also thought that was an important perspective. And I try to kind of bring that into the videos that mm -hmm. I do. Yeah, I mean, if you look at look at it, twenty years after our revolution, France turned atheist. <laughs> and exactly. yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's the context we come from, and you know, I know that I've been a couple times to Spain and to England and Ireland, and when you go there, the difference there's a big difference between what they think of as an old church and what we do. Like here in Indianapolis, we have a hundred year old church where I go, and it's a beautiful old, like classically built church, but yeah. that's relatively new as far as Europe standards are. You you can go into a thousand, you know, 1500 year old churches easily that are pretty much the same way they were when they were built. So, That's, yes. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Well, so I'm glad to talk to you about this a little bit too recently because so my work where I, my other job is full of people who are very PC and on Columbus Day, as I like to celebrate it, Columbus Day, um, yep. you had, you know, like we're talking about, you know, thankful for indigenous people and stuff like that. I'm just, I was, I didn't like push back or anything. I'm like, whatever, if that's technically what is the national holiday now, whatever. But I also was like, Hey, here's Christopher Columbus's tomb. Just thought this was a cool thing to share with you guys. And I just noticed this today. I just pushed it out there in our little Slack community. Cause I think that it's also good to remember him and him. I, I mean, flawed man for sure, but a really good and faithful Catholic in many ways. And I think that he, there's a lot of problems that we, with the way people understand him today and a lot of misconceptions. So I, I know we were actually supposed to talk on Columbus Day before we had to reschedule, but right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which would, which was just kind of almost providential, but it's, yeah, I'm curious. I think that that's something that I think just so many people have wrong, but how did they go wrong with Columbus? Well, you know, that's a great question um, because they have gone wrong with Columbus. Um, but I think, I think there's a couple layers of, and I'm going to use, you know, this word and I actually mean it, but there's a couple layers of bigotry that exist 
in the way that we view the historical perspective. And the biggest one, and this you'll find it on every college campus in the United States of America, it doesn't matter, well, I shouldn't say every, there's a couple schools that probably teach this correctly, but, but the vast majority, every college campus, every uh, high school, grade school that you're gonna find, and essentially everywhere in our, in our, in our uh, national psyche is, and it's the bigotry of presentism. And I didn't really understand this um, until Professor Thomas Madden of St. Louis University explained it to me. But um, in essence, what it is, is you, we think um, that we are the smartest, the most advanced civilization that's ever existed in human history. So when we look back at people, we view them through this, um, this prism of kind of like the caveman, like we've been progressing through civilizations. And now all of a sudden we've we've gained so much um, wisdom and understanding and we utilize our technology. We say, look, look at our technology that proves that we, we have progressed to this point. And it's, it's absolute nonsense. It's, 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 we have, we have, we, it's clearly we've devolved in many respects mm -hmm. um, in our current society. I mean, you just, you just go open the newspaper um, and read some of the stories that are going on there. I mean, we're debating whether or not, you know, and I'm not trying to get political, but we're debating whether or not you can murder children. Like that's, that's not an advance in civilization. That's, 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 you know, uh, demonic. And, um, it, it was that kind of ideology that Christopher Columbus was coming in contact with in the new world. But anyway, so that's, that's one entire thing that we have to view. Um, we have to look at the historical narrative not through necessarily our eyes, but a larger perspective. Like what, what was happening at the time? What was the philosophy at the time? Was that philosophy completely correct? What were there things that needed to be changed? And then go from there. That's the first thing. The second thing is we don't, because we're Americans, we don't understand what happened in the enlightenment era in terms of who wrote the histories. And what I mean by that is the English. And there's this thing called the black legend and it is real. It's a real thing. They, the, the English historians despised the Spanish because they were Catholic and the French, but mainly the Spanish. And they just wrote lies about these people. And, and we took that and we said, and now we just look at those histories and we're like, see, there you go. And the, and it gets very confusing because if you think about it, okay, so Christopher Columbus, and I'll get a little bit more into who he was and what happened, but Christopher Columbus you know, he was a major national figure in the history of Spain. Guess what? He had enemies. So if you just go and you read the narratives that his enemies write, you're going to come away and be like, wow, this is the worst guy ever. Yeah. But if you actually look at what actually happened, you look at Christopher Columbus and you're like, he's a hero. Now, like you said, he, he's fallen. And um, I, I highly recommend, don't take my word for any of this. There's, if you Google it, you can find on EWTN, they have it. Dr. Warren Carroll, the founder of Christendom College, wrote an exceptional essay on Christopher Columbus. I read it every Columbus Day because it's so important to understand what actually happened. Um, and I'll give, I'll give the example. So the first video I ever did was on Christopher Columbus. Um, the example, I'll give, I'll give you two examples. But the first one is um, of how we get the narrative wrong. We all, you know, you see the statues of Christopher Columbus. Even to this day, he's holding a globe. Right, and that's to represent the fact that Christopher Columbus was the one who figured out that the world wasn't flat, which is absolutely ridiculous. This is what I'm talking about. This is the English historians saying Catholics are stupid. They, they thought the world was flat, but now that we have the Enlightenment, we realize, and it took this Italian coming to Spain to prove the whole world that the earth wasn't flat because he didn't fall off the edge. You watch, there's a, there is a Bugs Bunny where he's Christopher Columbus cartoon where that's what he's doing. He's trying to prove to the Spanish court that no, look, the world is round, and they're all like, you're so stupid, and it's all these Catholic prelates being like, you're so stupid. Um, it drives me absolutely insane. No, everybody knew the world was round. Everybody knew the world was round. They would have looked at you the same way that people look at you today if you came around and was like, no, you know, the earth is flat. Back then, when Christopher Columbus was doing it, what actually happened was Christopher Columbus had this idea that the world was much smaller globe than the people thought it was at the time. And he went to the Portuguese and they said, man, you're crazy. You're, you're absolutely off your rocker. If you go west, you're going to die out there because that ocean is humongous. You're never going to be able to make it across. You're never going to be able to get all the way to Asia from here with the provisions that a ship could hold at that time. They're like, you know, absolutely no way. 
And Christopher Combs is like, no, I'm telling you, look at my math. My math checks out. We can make it. It's just, you know, we just have to go that way and we'll be fine. Portuguese said, absolutely not. Well, at the time, the Portuguese had figured out how to go around Africa and they were circumventing the, essentially the Muslim countries and they were going straight to the, um, to the, to the Indies for uh, the goods. And so that's how essentially the entire Muslim world started to fall apart at that time. But that doesn't matter. But the point was the Portuguese were way ahead of everyone. They were making huge fortunes. So then the Spanish were like, uh, this was Ferdinand and Isabella. They were, they were getting concerned because the Portuguese are making fortunes and we are not making fortunes. So they are like, hey, maybe we'll take a risk on this Columbus guy with his idea about going west because the Portuguese had, you know, they had all the trade routes around Africa. Um, and so that's essentially what happened. You know, Columbus would not have sailed west if he could do his math right. You know, that's the essence of the story. Now, just because he's a bad mathematician doesn't mean that he isn't a hero. Like, the things that he does on that voyage are absolutely heroic. He saves his crew numerous times. Um, you know, right before, the night before they make landfall, there's this beautiful story about how, you know, he kneels down on the deck with his whole crew and they pray the rosary and they beg the blessed mother because they have no food and water right? They're out in the middle of the ocean. They have no food and water. They're, they're on their last rations. They don't even have enough to turn around. Um, and he's been, you know, essentially telling them that we're not going as far as we are. And they realize that, you know, they're in big trouble. And the next day, obviously they find, they, um, they find, they see land and it's the, the finding of the new continent. And, um, so anyways, that's the first misconception, right? The world, no one thought the world was flat. Everybody knew it was round. Christopher Columbus, if he hadn't run into North or South America, he would have been in big trouble because they're all going to die out there, essentially. And he knew that that was a risk, too. That, you know, oh, he, yes. Uh, right. But, yeah, he knew. He knew that. But he just thought, you know, I think we can go that way and we can make it. Because when Columbus died, he still thought he had found Asia, right? He, they, they, at that point, they still thought. I mean, there was, there was some people say, no, he didn't find it because, you know, they could still do the math correctly. But he still thought, you know, he, that's why they, they called him in. Yeah, and we were still looking for the westward route to Asia. Exactly. Two hundred years later, under Jefferson's administration, I mean, that's why we did the right. Lucy Clark expedition, and we're still trying to find. They still didn't know how much mass there was in North and South America. Right. Fully, right? They really, didn't understand the size and scope of this, these two continents. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And so the first thing is, he is a discoverer, right? Whether people like it, oh well, there were there were Native Americans here, there were Indians here. Obviously, he didn't discover anything. Well, no, no, that's not actually true because the Europeans didn't realize that they were there. He discovered them mm -hmm. for the Europeans. So it, anyway, so that's the first thing. The second example, I'll make it quick, is they say, you know, he, he had all these slaves. These, and they, they, I mean, they, they come up with some very bizarre situations where he's like transporting sex slaves back to Spain. And first of all, that's not true. Um, the problem was he put his brothers in charge as governor uh, when he when he came back over the second time, and they they got into trouble um, with the Native American tribes there. There were a couple of tribes. Obviously, the Aztecs were depraved on a mass scale. Um, but the first time that he came, the Indians that he met were completely overrun by the second time he got there, to the point where um, they were beat. When he came back, the the new Native American tribe that had had arrived, they're called the Caribs that's where we get the word uh, Caribbean from, they were cannibals and they were eating the people that had been there previously. So it wasn't like these were some just peaceful, you know, regular, they just wanted to live their own lives. I, th these were seriously, um, I hate to say it because it sounds so un-PC, but this is depravity. You, you can't have civilizations sacrificing other human beings and eating other human beings. And we should just say, well, you know, that's just their culture. Um, you know, that's great. And I, I, that's, so that's a, that's the other kind of, um, um, misconception that we face today. And this kind of, this actually applies both to, uh, the Crusades and the Inquisition, which is, um, you know, the United States of America, obviously in the last, you know, 80 years, we went through the civil rights movement. It was a phenomenal movement. You know, we, we recognized a fundamental truth that man uh, has equal dignity across the races. This is, this is obviously, this is profoundly Catholic teaching. Um, and it is, it is true. It's a true statement. But what's happening now, or it's been happening since you know, our lifetime, is that we've extrapolated that idea to 
that the equality of dignity and culture and religion and you know pick whatever whatever thing you want to pick and we just say everything's the same you know feminism um is the same thing and and it you know feminism is a little different but no cultures are not equal in dignity mm -hmm. there are some cultures that are better better than other cultures and if you don't believe this you actually don't believe in christianity because this this is fundamental to the christian um uh, the christian doctrine you you can't believe that to be a christian is the same as being a buddhist or is the same as being a muslim now you as a christian can you know obviously do things that are sinful and wrong like other religions and it doesn't deny people salvation but but to the doctrine and the dogma of the catholic faith is is god's um you know intended culture slash religion i actually i should say religion but then the culture that comes out of it namely christendom is the fulfillment in in a societal way of those doctrines and dogmas and so that's something that we have gotten completely wrong in our modern mindset that cultures are not the same they're they're not there are some cultures that are better than others and i'll be the first as an american to say there are cultures that exist that are better than our culture mm -hmm. you know like there there are things that i wish we could really in other countries be like i wish we could be more like those guys in this mm -hmm. this regard or that regard and so um, I think that that's a major misconception uh, that we face today is no, no, not all cultures are the same. And obviously Columbus is denigrated because obviously he didn't believe that. The Spanish didn't believe that. No, it's better to be Christian than to be pagan. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I think that it's, people don't want to make that truth claim either that, you know, one set of ideas can be true objectively, right? It's, there's a sense that we want to have this relativistic, uh, right way of like I'm living my truth or whatever that is and while you have your experience you're not allowed your own set of you know objective truths you know right. two plus two doesn't equal five for you and six for someone else it's the same yeah. principle you know across time and, and the laws of physics don't change for any one of us and most right. people I would say most even of the relativist people will would agree that like science has set principles and exactly. <laughs> until they become inconvenient, like, you know, right. and some of those other ones and differences between the sides. But yeah, I, I think that that's something that we just are afraid to do. And, and the other thing is that expounding upon the, or believing in the truths of Christianity doesn't mean that every single thing that the Christian Christendom ever did was good, right? Or right. That it was the best thing that could have been done, even when it may not have been the worst thing. And while atrocities might happen, that doesn't excuse it because you're Christian. It's saying that there are truth claims here that you have to deal with if you want to attack the foundation. And the only reason you can criticize Christendom is because it holds up these uh, standards that as objective. And when it doesn't live up to them, you're holding them to those standards that come from Christianity, that come from this belief system. And no, that's, yeah, that's absolutely right. And so they're like holding you, it seems like people today, the secularists are holding Christians to a bar that, you know, we set for ourselves that we may not always live up to, but right. then they also don't believe in, right? They're saying, right. And, and so it's, it's sort of, I don't know, I guess hypocritical is not necessarily the word for it, but it's really a weird set of standards that are, if, if everything is my truth, your truth, then why does it even matter if I live up to these standards that I set for myself? Yeah, it, it, it's, you're exactly right. Um, you know, obviously I agree. I agree that as, as Catholics, as Christians, we, we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard, which is why I love doing the Catholic history show because, you know, I don't have any problem being like, okay, what Columbus did when he came back and he was sick and he, he did, he had, he got a thousand slaves of the, or he captured a thousand Indians. He turned them into slaves. Uh, he was brought back to Spain and put in chains um, and well, under arrest for doing that. You know why? Because Queen Isabella was saying, no, these are, these are my subjects and no, none of these subjects will be enslaved, right? So we're talking about, we're talking about in the 1490s in anti-slavery doctrine in a Catholic uh, regal court. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're talking about the emancipation of the slaves in 1863 in the United States of America. And yet Columbus is this 
horrible, terrible person. Well, Queen Isabella realized this truth a couple hundred years before um, the United States had the American Civil War. Like, you know, you're exactly right. We have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Christopher Columbus has to be said, you know, what he did in certain circumstances was the wrong thing. But we don't, we shouldn't be ripping down statues of people because they're sinners, right? This, this, is a, this is another fundamental problem of our society is, hey, guys, um, judge others the way you want to be judged. You're ripping statues down of people for a perceived um, indiscretion. And it's like, what, what do you think is going to happen to you at the judgment, right? When, when uh, you have to come before God, you, you, you're perfectly good. You know, just because you're uh, anti-slavery, you know, you think that's like, that's it? That's, that's the bar? No, you're exactly right. You know, we've, we've set a much lower bar for ourselves and then we hold historical figures to a much higher bar. It's, it's, it's absolutely backwards. You know, uh, we, we need to hold ourselves to a higher bar. You, you really want to progress and make the civilization better, then you hold yourself to the highest possible bar. And, and then, you know, you can give benefit of the doubt to others especially those people that are dead that can't defend themselves. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you hope for, you hope for the best. And if we did that, if we held ourselves the highest possible standard as a society, you would see amazing changes in our civilization. Absolutely amazing. So absolutely amazing changes, but mm-hmm. you know, I agree. No, I agree. I think that that's just something that's so hard is getting people to recognize that, we come to all truth over time gradually, right? We wouldn't expect Mm -hmm. people 300 years ago to understand Einsteinian physics, right? Because we're we're just working out Newtonian physics and the implications of that. And moral truths, we come to that same, like over time you have to, and, and I think that there's even a lot more backsliding there because, you know, at least scientific truths, you know, you're kind of always building on something. You normally don't like build this thing up and then, you know, throw it all out the window. It does happen now sometimes, but um, I think you see that in morality a lot more where we kind of, I think we're building up a pretty good sense of freeing people, freeing people from slavery, moving towards a more racially equitable society. And then you have the Holocaust, you have, you know, the regimes of China and the USSR and the, to, or in the ninth or the twentieth century, and I think that I mean that's pretty grave uh, problems. And for these people who are tearing down a Columbus statue and not a Stalin statue, I think right. you have some questions that you need to ask. You. <laughs> yes, okay. yes. Uh, there's problems, uh, obviously, with what Columbus did. I don't think it compares in scale to what you saw. Not, not, um, e- not even close. I mean, he didn't murder anyone, right? Like. He wasn't talking about genocide. They claim genocide, right? Because he introduced small, they, they say he introduced smallpox. So here, here's another thing. This is a, one of the things I like to say. Okay, Columbus knew that he had blankets that had smallpox on it and he gave it to the Indians to commit genocide. This is what, uh, 150 years before germ theory? More than that? More than 150 years before germ theory. How did Columbus, the, the guy, this depraved psychopath, understand that the blankets that he had were going to murder the entire the entirety of mm-hmm. the Native American population. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yep. Uh, again, it's it's a sign of presentism. It's like you don't even understand the historical timeline, let alone um, you know just obviously basic scientific development. It, mm-hmm. It's it, it's when it, when when Indigenous People Day comes around, it's 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 kind of it's very aggravating because it's like come on like we're better than this. I'm not saying we shouldn't. Um, and I have, you know, family that, uh, I native American family. It's, I'm not saying we shouldn't celebrate the native Americans in certain respects. There are some native American Indian tribes that did some amazing, wonderful, beautiful things. And we should hold those up. But this idea that all the native Americans were great and this white supremacy psychopath, uh, from Spain, actually he's Italian from Spain, uh, came over and just tried to commit genocide on everyone. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. No, I agree. Yeah. And so I kind of want to pivot actually to another topic sure. that I mentioned. Um, one that I think is very, very controversial, which is the Crusades, because I think that 
so my mom is actually a Spanish teacher. She, so we, she knows the history of Spain very well. And um, 1492 is not only notable because of Columbus set, setting sail, but in Spain, that's when they finally kicked the Moors out um, right. where, where they'd been conquered. That was, um, it was from 711 to 1492 that they were under Muslim rule. And I think that one thing that I think people don't realize is how much of the Roman Empire that had turned Christian that was peaceful Christians, mostly peaceful, you know, right? Unlike the mostly peaceful protests, it was yes. actually <laughs> yeah. the time of all along Northern Africa and all along the Mediterranean that was Christian or Jewish, largely, obviously around Judea and everything. But then when the Muslims came in, really tore apart and conquered all of Northern Africa, much of uh, you know, Spain and all sorts of other parts. And these crusades were actually happening amid that, that this was a defensive war. And you, you can't just sit there and necessarily, they, I guess people will be like, well, they took the fight, you know, and they went and attacked the Holy Land and it was just trying to get the Holy Land. Well, that's where, that was the center. Like, that's like saying, you know, the British burned Washington, D.C. in the War of 1812. It's like, yeah, that was the capital. You, you were, you were, you were, and you're fighting a real war, you have to make military maneuvers and go after valuable positions that are politically significant. Yes. And I, it, 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 I just think that there's a, well, you can tell that, first of all, our generation, at least my generation especially, has a very, very low enlistment record. And I can say I've never served in the military, mm-hmm. but we don't understand what it's like, I think, to live in. You said you were in the Navy, right? Yes. So, sure. yeah, so I think that you, even if you're not in the war rooms, you have a much better understanding uh, of what you have to do and why you have to do it. Mm-hmm. But you want to talk a little bit about some of those misconceptions, I think, that there are about the Crusades? I, I yeah, absolutely. The the thing that you the what you just brought up, the Reconquista, is the longest war in human history. No war that we know about ever took place was longer than that. And yet if you went to your average American, actually if you went to almost any American, they would have no idea what you're talking about, right? Like the Reconquista, you know, I when I bring it when I used to bring it up with my students, I'd say, you know, we're we're gonna talk about the Reconquista today, and they would think about like Cortez in you know the conquistadors and it's like no no the reconquista and it's it's absolutely this is another example of the black legend we're just going to ignore this because it's catholic spain and it's absolutely reprehensible um we have to do a better job as catholics as christians and to to actually tell these stories and understand these stories appropriately um so you know a, a lot of the misconceptions right uh crusades were this war that um, it's what happened in Europe was we had all these knights and we had all these sons of, of lords and they didn't have any land to give them. So they had to send them over to the Middle East to take the land from them, from the, the poor, the poor Muslims and, and, and uh, steal their land so that we'd have more land. It, it, it's, again, I mean, use this word again because it is true. It's reprehensible. Uh, no, that's not what happened. Um, the Muslim Turks had moved in, obviously, I'm, I'm good. I'll give a little bit more vague generalization because it's such a broad topic, but, uh, they were committing actual atrocities. They were murdering people, uh, they're, um, Christians and they were sending them into slavery. Um, and some of these were obviously schismatics groups, right? Because the, the, the emperor in Constantinople is the one who, you know, writes to the Pope and says, Hey, um, we got a real problem here. They're overrunning us. Uh, the entire, essentially what's today, Turkey, um, is completely overrun. What, what are we going to do? And, um, Urban the second says, okay, uh, calling the crusade. Uh, it's, it, this is one of the things I brought up in the last video I did was, you know, it's interesting that, at the Council of Clermont, when he, Urban II, announces, really announces uh, to the world, to Europe, to the Christendom, the crusade, is when we actually get codified in, um, into, really, I mean, it's actually, it's been going on for centuries, but when the Pope recognizes the whole Ash Wednesday, and when we get marked with the cross, we're actually crusaders, because we're taking on the cross on Ash Wednesday. So I, I always think that's an interesting correlation that, you know, obviously most people would be horrified if they knew that they were, they were in any way associated with the Crusades, but 
And the, uh, the second misconception I'll talk about with the Crusades really is that we look at it, and this is another topic I brought up in my last video. Um, we look at it through this, this lens that um, we, we look at it through the colonial period of uh, the European nations. Um, we look at Europe as this powerhouse of technology and um, we have, we're wealthier and we are, we, uh, we have better technology. We have better armies. We have, you know, we have um, better weapons. Um, this is not the case, <laughs> right? Christendom, specifically Western Christendom, is exponentially poorer than the Muslim lands. Exponentially poorer. Um, I mean, it was like the little guy going in, it was David versus Goliath. And David was uh, the Christian nations and Goliath are the Muslim nations. Now, we, like I said, in the last video I did was, we had, we had the Christians had um, some advantages, namely that <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Muslims were kind of interfighting at the time, and there were some certain things that went incredibly well for the Christians in the First Crusade, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't this massive attempt at land grab. It was literally Christian men marching into uh, the Levant to stop the atrocities that were taking place um, by uh, the Turks and by the Mohammedans, and um, what the way I used to teach it to my students is like, this is this is like the GIs storming Normandy. They're going to put down. Um, they're going to try and stop a uh, you know a completely out of control, um, depraved, demonic uh, administration or nation or whatever you want to call it that's that's taken over the Holy Land, and uh, they're there to bring essentially freedom and peace. Again, like you said, atrocities do take place. Um, and one of the ones that they, well, the, one of the ones they say happens is when the, the crusaders take Jerusalem and they, they kill everybody and the blood was so high that like they had to wade through the blood through the streets of Jerusalem. Obviously the, the number of people that we would take to actually have that much blood in the city is, uh, was exponentially more than could fit into actual Jerusalem. But regardless, uh, you, you don't understand how siege warfare worked in the medieval age, right? If you, in this you know, Al Alexander, even back to Alexander, it was the same thing. If you laid siege to a city and the city refused to give itself up and you were forced to storm the castle, it was, you know, an all out brutal fight through the streets. And, you know, um, again, we, we can sit here in armchair a uh, thousand years after the event takes place and be like, I can't believe they did these atrocities. And it's like, yeah, there's so much more going on that you don't really understand. Um, but again, the Crusades is such a large, a large topic because, you know, there's not just one crusade. It was a hundred years of the Latin kingdom and the, the Christian kings in Jerusalem. And then you have, I mean, you have uh, Louis the Ninth, St. Louis, um, you know, going in, uh, you know, almost a hundred, almost a hundred, almost a hundred years later, you have Richard the Lionheart in the third crusade. You have the fourth crusade where the Venetians just decide to attack Constantinople yeah. and take that over. I was going to say, that's one of the worst is, that was really a point of contention still for our yeah. Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters, because that, yeah, they were completely, you know, they weren't doing anything wrong, and we just right. swung up and we just our Christian brothers. <laughs> and yeah, and I, I think that of all the Crusades that, or of all the problems that the Crusades had, that to me is one of, if not the worst thing that the Crusade right. did, really. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree 100%. Um, you know, but I, I, not to not to take away from that. It it what they did was wrong. It was the wrong thing to do. But they and you can make an argument that Constantinople never would have fallen to the the Muslims if the Fourth Crusade hadn't taken place. But a lot of the relics that still exist in Europe were brought back by um, the Crusaders in the Fourth Crusade, and so. And not to say that that obviously is a good thing. I mean, Venice is a very beautiful city because of the Fourth Crusade. But um, I, sorry, I, I just I kind of lost my thought. But the point is, yeah, no, you're right. They, this is a huge topic, and the worst part of about the entire Crusades really is, you're right, the Fourth Crusade, which is Christian on Christian fighting, which kind of is the, the point I make about the Spanish Inquisitions and the videos I did on those, because the worst part of the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition specifically, is um, 
the the Christian on Christian persecution. It was it was Catholic. It wasn't just Christian on Christian. It was Catholic on Catholic persecution. It wasn't even Catholic on Protestant. And again, an, another uh, ridiculous misconception that exists in our world today. But yeah, no, the Crusades are such a huge topic. But the idea that these were like some um, bloodlust, uh, crazy psychopaths that were just trying to steal land. Um, and they don't understand who the Crusaders were. No, these were devout Catholics who believed that this was their way to, to salvation because they existed in an industry that was not easily lent to uh, getting to heaven, shall we say. You know, you're fighting and killing other people. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times you're with unsavory people. Mm-hmm. So this was the way in which they could do reparation and they could actually fight for a good cause. They, were, they weren't going to fight over land. They were going to fight for the Christian faith and to free the Christians uh, in the Holy Land. So I, Crusaders are heroes, not all of them, but like Joffrey, he's a hero. Sorry, guys. Like he's a hero. We have a saint who's a crusader, right? St. Louis is a crusader. I mean, anyways, it's, it's, it boggles my mind that people, it's drive by history is what it is. They just like, oh, Christians bad, Europe bad, colonialism bad, like, Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think it's this sense, too, that today basically any war is bad. And I think that we can talk today about modern wars that may or may not yeah. be the best ideas, right? Maybe what we did going into Iraq wasn't the best idea. Maybe we, what we did going into Vietnam wasn't right. Or what you can have qualms about that, but I think that it seems like everybody is just completely pacifist. And I'm... And, I wonder if they would have that tune if they lived, you know, during the War of 1812 or if they lived during times when, you know, it wasn't very easy to sit back and not have to participate in these things and you weren't under attack. Like, you know, if you lived in Britain in 1940, 1942, you know, I think you'd have a very different look at what war is and why you need to be ready to take part in a war uh, if right. if it's necessary and not that we want that but right. when it's thrust upon you you have to defend yourself and whether that's an individual you know attacking you and you have to defend yourself or right. a, your nation as well no you're you're 100 right i think I, and this is one of the 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 uh, things i think americans really need to wake up to the fact we have the luxury of being pacifists since 1865 we haven't had for i mean even even the second and first world war mm-hmm. you know the kaiser wasn't invading the united states now hitler had some crazy scheme to invade the united states and i'm not saying we shouldn't have fought those wars but we need to wake up to the realization especially when we're looking at historical narratives that we have the luxury of being uh anti-war and i'm not saying like i i'm for war and obviously i was i i've seen enough in my life to know that, no, I'm not for war, Mm -hmm. but we should be thanking the good Lord that we have this luxury since 1865. No one's, no one's now, I mean, we're, we're in a sort of fourth generational war going on right now with certain pockets in the United States where they're burning cities down, but we don't have a foreign nation that's bulldozing its way in and slaughtering you if you don't acquiesce to what they want. This is what they were dealing back in the Middle Ages with. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it wasn't, there wasn't this idea of, of, of a global unity sort of thing going on. And I'm not talking really about globalism. It's just, we, after the last century, the whole world is kind of like, you know what? How about we just don't kill each other the way we were doing last time? I mean, the Second World War, you know, more people died in that war than all the wars prior to it. Like, it, it was a it was a disaster to the world. And so I, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying we should be pro-war in the United States, but I'm saying we should, we should be so thankful and grateful for the reality that we don't live in a world where we need to be, um, we need to be uh, really all that concerned. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going through a national election right now and war isn't even really all that talked about right yeah. now. And that's, that's a wonderful thing, but, it, it come, there's, there's been a price that people have paid for that. It wasn't like we all just decided we woke up one day and we're like, let's just not have wars anymore. Mm-hmm. No, that, that's not how it worked. And so when we, specifically when we judge 
prior civilizations and peoples, you need to realize that the circumstances that they were living with were probably radically different than the ones that you have to live with. Mm-hmm. And that's something we should be very thankful for. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. I, I think that that's, yeah, I think that being grateful for it is definitely the attitude we should take. And yeah, no, I agree. I, I, and I think, I think that's how you avoid wars in the future is you recognize we're not, we're really, we're not special in terms of who we are, but our circumstances are definitely special. And if we want to be the people that are deserving of those, we need to be thankful for the situation that we find ourselves in. That's, I mean, that's my personal, that's one of the things that I just, I get upset about with people um, quite a bit, specifically, you know, in the millennial generation is that there was, there has been, there has been a market cost and I won't say freedom because I think that that word is so mis, mis, uh, misunderstood today, but there is, there, there is a market, there, there, was, there was a real cost and a price that was paid by prior generations for us to be able to live, um, you know, in essence, tranquil lives. Like we have been given great blessings and we should be very thankful for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that that is a huge thing. I mean, so many people have sacrificed. I mean, my grandpa was in Vietnam and while that's not a threat to us, I, I know his stories and I know that right. they're not unusual to what happened in World War II, World War One, and, you know, before. Right. Um, and I kind of want to circle back. You mentioned the Inquisition. Right. And I think that'd be cool or good to talk about that a little bit as well, because I think there's this sense that basically what happened is, is, you know, the Muslims came in, you know, and basically were forcing conversions from Christians in the Spain. Right. And then Spain just turned around and like, attacked Jews and Muslims like crazy left and right all over the place and like yep. I, I, I think that that's the image that people have of what the Inquisition was and right. not quite accurate <laughs> to say the least. No that's not accurate at all um, yeah it's because again it's drive-by history people have a lot of people have seen specifically in in the baby boomer generation um, but I'm sure millennials and now more generations because of YouTube have seen it but the Monty Python version of mm-hmm. the Inquisition that's what people know about the Inquisition, you know. Oh, um, it's these crazy uh, Catholic prelates in these red clothes, and they're very sinister, and they have long pointed nose, and they're super evil. Um, obviously, that's that's not what it was. I, one of the things I say I like to say to my students, or what I said to students was, um, you know, if you guys like saying the Rosary, you can thank the Inquisition because Saint Dominic was an Inquisitor. He was in uh, Southern France trying to sell the Albigensian. Um, heresy that was taking place. It's very sick, evil heresy. Um, but the Inquisition was started specifically for, and there's debate about exactly when it started. In my video, I said it was in the early uh, 12th century, which, you know, that's what Dr. Warren Carroll says. So I believe, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but that's what uh, uh, Professor Thomas Madden, I'm going to bring his name up again, because if, if you're interested in really learning more about these kind of medieval myths, he has a, uh, a modern scholar sort of class on like eight medieval myths one of them's about torture how all these torture devices were actually created in the light men and then they just blamed it on medieval times um anyways they're very interesting so i you can rec you can find it on audible and probably in itunes but uh, he walks through the inquisition pretty well he actually has a very full length um uh uh discourse on the inquisition which is very interesting but regardless so it's uh, professor thomas man he's a very good historian there's a couple of Thomas Asperge, who's not a Catholic, very good medieval historian. Um, he's got several books out. One of them is on, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm giving plugs to all these people, but it's not me. So I'm just, I'm just trying to give as much information as I can so people know that I'm just not making this up. Yeah, uh, no, I think it's definitely good to give people like, hey, if you want to dive deeper, here's other Right, stuff. right. Um, so anyways, uh, Thomas Asperge, another great historian, not a Catholic, so, um, but still a very good medieval historian. Uh, back to the Inquisition, though. Inquisition was started specifically as a pro-life movement, right? It is a pro-life movement. And I actually did a video on that, and people lost their minds. I don't know if they watched the whole thing, but <laughs> I got a lot. You can go in the comments, and you can see, like, how dare you say this is murder? These are the supposed Christians. Um, I even had a bishop that got very upset at me, um, which I won't name him now. But I try to be as charitable as I can because I believe in the obedience of the church. But regardless, there's a lot of misconceptions about the Inquisition. Um, I say it's a pro-life movement specifically because, right, 
during, um, we'll say early medieval times, uh, we'll say 11th century and on, um, it actually goes back further than that, but it's easier to kind of understand the medieval period, obviously post uh, Charlemagne. And I like, I, like to, I like to talk about it post uh, 1066 when obviously William the Conqueror, because mm -hmm. before that it's still pretty bad in Europe. But regardless, medieval period, um, the heresy is a capital crime. Uh, you will be executed um, by the state if you are a heretic. Um, this, this might seem barbaric or um, insane in some respects, but it, 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 was, it was considered a capital crime because if you didn't, if you didn't recognize uh, the authority structure that was given to the European state um, coming from God, uh, not 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 divine right of kings because that that's actually not a medieval yeah. not a medieval philosophy at all again another misconception but if you didn't understand that 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 um that right the christian basis was how we based our entire civilization you were a real, real threat to um the the state and now you could say well why can't you just let some some heretic go live in peace somewhere else they did they did that all the time like if you wanted to go be a crazy hermit and live in the forest or even live in town and just like keep your ideas to yourself, you're going to be fine. No one's going to kill you. No one's going to execute you. Um, but the problem came when people would go into the, the streets and say, no, the church is lying. It's all fake. The King isn't real. The Lord isn't real. Well, now, now you're really, you're, you're um, exhibiting um, uh, sedition. You're, you're committing treason. So they would execute you. Well, you know, that's fine, and we can debate whether or not that's appropriate, and that's, again, that's fine, but what happens when you're in a civilization when, you know, your lord or your king uh, doesn't even really know how to read or write? Not saying that they're not intelligent, but they, they don't have, you know, the ability really to do their own studying, specifically when it came to ideas in religion. Mm -hmm. So, what happens is, and this is what happened, you had, say you're, you're a guy and you're walking, you, you own a big farm and your neighbor next to you has a smaller farm and he wants your farm. What is he, if he's not, if he's not um, a good guy, he goes to the Lord and's like, hey, my neighbor with the big farm, he's actually a heretic. So they bring you into court and they line you up and they're like, are you a heretic? You say, no, I'm not a heretic. And the Lord says, well, you know, I, I don't really know if you're a heretic or not. But just to be on the safe side, we're just going to execute you. And that was happening in Europe, in Christendom. And so the Pope said, we got to stop this. We need an organization that will actually determine whether or not somebody is a heretic. And that's how the Inquisition was born. And it, it performed its job very well. Um, you know, the Albigensian Crusade is a crusade most people don't even know about because of how well the Inquisition worked in the southern part of France. It was a massive revolution that was taking place where it, I mean, it was Gnosticism and it was completely insane. And it was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was, it was very, very bad heresy. Um, you know, it, it taught people to try and almost starve themselves to death because the physical world is, is mm -hmm. evil. Um, it it w did horrible things to women, um, uh, subjecting them to all kinds of of uh, essentially torture is what it is because as a woman you were seen as evil because you would entrap souls into physical bodies i mean it was a super evil heresy and that's where saint dominic came in yeah. so then you get to the spanish inquisition um which is obviously after really after the protestant reformation it's very very deep history but there's really two parts of the spanish inquisition the first would be the inquisition against the conversos which were Jews that converted to the Catholic faith. And there's still debate in the church today whether or not uh, these were like, you know, infiltrators into the church. But really what happened was when the Black, Black Plague um, came into Europe and was killing everybody, one of the biggest scapegoats were the Jews. Uh, it's the Jews. The Jews are the reasons we have the Black Plague. Obviously, you know, that's, that's not accurate. It's a disease. It's a pathogen. I mean, our blessed mother said that if we had remained faithful to the rosary, she said that to Alan de la Roche, you know, it probably wouldn't have happened. Like she kind of, she said the same thing at Fatima about the second world war. Regardless, we didn't. And, um, the black plague came to Europe and just decimated everything. Um, throughout, you brought up the Reconquista throughout European history, Spain was the center for um, uh, Jewish refugees. There were two centers. 
Spain was one. The second was the Papal States. The Pope always allowed the Jews to come into the Papal States when they were being kicked out of the other countries, specifically England and France. They were doing it all the time. They were kicking them out, bringing them back in, kicking them out, bringing them back in. Um, and Spain was the second one because the Spanish realized when they were going through the Reconquista, we can't, we can't afford any more enemies. We already got the Moors. That's enough. You know what? You Jews, you want to come here. You want to have your own little uh, religious services and have your own communities. That's fine. You do that. Then the Black Plague comes and everyone freaks out. And there were, there were people that were going around and they were forced converting Jews into the Catholic faith. This was not the Inquisition. The Inquisition was not doing this. These were Spanish people that were like, we can't have any more Jews. You can go and you can get baptized or you can be executed. Yeah. Most of the Jews were like, sec it was not the church hierarchy. No, 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 no. Yeah, that's this was secular, secular organizations, people, yeah, doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was not the church that was forced baptizing people because obviously that's against the Catholic faith. Yeah. And yeah. once everything, once everything calmed down, the church went back to these conversos, these forced converts and said, look, you're not held to this baptism because you were forced to do it. The church, the church recognized that. And uh, the beautiful, wonderful thing about it, if you, you know, you, you want to say that there's probably some cynics out there would be like, that's horrifying. But the vast majority of these people that were forced converted wanted to remain in the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. And it tells you about um, the efficacy of baptism, but regardless, they stay in the Catholic faith and then they start rising up into positions of power. And eventually what happens is you get uh, people kind of two camps um, in the regal court. And <clears throat> excuse me, you have one camp, which is people that have been Catholic, you know, they're all their generations. Then you have these people that have been, maybe they're like one generation away from these people that were Jews prior. And so there's this animosity that builds between the two of them. And so there's these claims that are made that these forced converts are actually infiltrating the the, uh, the state and they are um they are causing problems or they're trying to destroy the catholic state from within these are fake catholics these are former jews and they're you know doing all this but they are catholics i mean say what you want um obviously again there's people that that disregard this and say no the infiltration was real um so then the spanish inquisition kicks off this spanish inquisition uh there are atrocities committed. But this, the important distinction is this is actually not ecclesiastical inquisition. This was a secular inquisition. Mm -hmm. There were um, ecclesiastical people. There were clergy, some clergy on the inquisition, but it was being run by the state. It was not being run by the church. And the Pope puts, puts a stop to it, says, no, we're not doing this. We need to have, if you want to do this, we need to have an actual inquisition. inquisition um, and of course, when, when it actually got under control, when the, when the papal legates came in and reformed the Inquisition, guess what? All of a sudden, we stopped killing all these conversos. That was the first one. The second one was the, in, the Spanish Inquisition against the Protestants, where almost no one was executed. Um, they burned a lot of Protestant books, um, and uh, they, you know, they, they really uh, codified in Spain and then eventually the papal states. I actually think it's the papal states first and then Spain. Um, you know, the index of prohibited books, which we had until the 1960s. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, so that's kind of the Spanish Inquisition. It's very much misunderstood. There's, you know, decades of history there that need to be understood before you really, before we really talk about the Spanish Inquisition. But it wasn't, it wasn't evil. Um, it was an organization that was trying to prevent uh, the um, distribution of false teachings. And guess what? We still have it today. It still exists today in the church. It's just called the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. Uh, their job is to prevent uh, false teachings. Now, you know, it, the Inquisition um, used to be more focused on just broadly, like, uh, refuting Protestant errors. <clears throat> but that was before the really, the understood of the break um, between uh, the Christian faiths. Um, you know, for a period of time there, the Protestants were claiming to be the true church. Obviously, they, they still do to a certain extent, but Catholics realized, no, you know, they're Protestants, they're protesting against the Catholic church. Um, but the CDF still exists today. It's in the same buildings uh, that, you know, the Inquisition was in for now a couple hundred years. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, 
it's sure any organization i this is the example i give i think one of the videos and i used to tell me any any institution can commit bad acts mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that we the inquisition or the the institution itself is bad for instance the state department there's plenty of things the state department does that are completely wrong the wrong thing to do should we just you know dissolve the state department does it not serve any function um and it the inquisition is the same way no it, it, it serves a very important function in the church which is to to explain um to the faithful what the true teachings of the church are if you don't have that then who knows what's true you know um we need that teaching authority in the church and that's why we still have it to this day so you know obviously they're what they did to the conversos i'm not obviously were was the wrong thing Mm -hmm. uh, I will defend the Spanish Inquisition every day of my life against the Protestants because they didn't kill anybody. I mean, they killed, I, I don't know, maybe 15 well, people were executed. In the Inquisition courts, from what I've heard too on Catholic radio, is that sometimes people were like being, they were in a secular court for some other crime and they would commit heresy in the court so they could go to the Inquisition courts. And a lot of times, yeah. if you would just renounce your heresy, they would let yeah. you live out your life on a monastery. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. If, if people were. The heretics that would get killed were the ones who were unapologetic and would, you know, hold on to their heresy. Whereas yep. people who would renounce it and who would, you know, go back and say, I want to become a faithful Catholic, I see the error in my way, they would they would be shown mercy. And so and, and it's, you know, I'm sure that it's probably very similar today for our laws on treason. I mean, that's still one of the few ways that you can be put to death in for a federal crime. There's not very right. many. It's normally, you know, murder and a lot of those crimes are generally state crimes. But right. it is, treason is still a very serious thing. And it's because if treasonous acts go through them, it's, it can upset the entire system and cause a lot of serious problems. I think that that's, you know, to me, as someone who's a fairly, I would say, anti-death penalty in most cases, yeah. um, that's one where I think that it's probably the most justified of all because there is a serious threat to the common good there. I think that there, you can't, if there's a spy who has atomic codes, it's very hard to squash that threat without getting rid of the person who has that, uh, those, that information in their head and you can get that stuff out because they do. <laughs> and yes. I'm, Do Mafia dons have been running organizations from jail for a century now. It, and it that's happened. true. So, no, I, that's another great point. Um, you know, we have the luxury today of being against the the death penalty. They didn't have that luxury, you know, a couple hundred years ago. Um, you know, we could say all day we need you know different um, reform movements and things like that. And I'm, and I'm all pro reform and I mean, I deal with the justice system all the time now in my new, in my new job, but, um, and it's very broken. I will be the first to attest to that. It is an incredibly broken, um, situation, but we have the luxury of being against the death penalty and it's a wonderful luxury to have. Um, it was not always that way. You didn't have the abilities to contain people that were trying to commit grave acts of evil. Um, on society and so you had to be more uh, you had to be more um, forceful in that way and the, other, the only other thing I'll talk about the Inquisition is they talk about torture all the time how you know they would torture people um, and if you look at the actual the, the things that the Inquisition was allowed to do in the form of torture um, if you go into boot camp in the United States military you will be tortured more than people were tortured during the Inquisition um, and I will tell you that from experience they Would, they were allowed to hang people upside down for like five minutes or something like that. And they're allowed to do it twice because it like makes it all the blood rush to your head and it becomes, you become complete. It's not a pleasant sensation by yeah. any means. They were not allowed to rack people out. They were not allowed to like keep them in dungeons and beat them. And you know, they, they were allowed and it was in very different directions with their arms and legs tied to them. Yeah, no, they, it was, it was, yeah. It was very, very humane. And you're right. Everybody wanted to go to the ecclesiastical courts because the mercy was so much better than the secular courts. Everybody, if you had gone to, if you were living in the Middle Ages and you were being brought up on charges, you were begging to go to the ecclesiastical courts. Mm -hmm. um, you were begging to go in front of the Inquisition because the, the mercy was, these people loved God, right? 
they weren't some kind of just mean, crusty, uh, angry, um, want to kill everybody group of people. They loved Jesus Christ and his church, and they wanted everybody to go to heaven. That was their goal. That's what they wanted. Um, and if that is your mindset, it's the mindset that our civilization could do a lot more with today. Um, if that's your mindset, guess what? You're gonna, you're gonna, a lot more mercy obviously is going to come out of you because you know, God, God loves mercy. God is just, but he is also merciful. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Thomas Aquinas says that, or argued that heresy was a graver sin than murder because, you know, murder, you kill somebody in this life. Heresy, you can lead someone away from heaven for all eternity. And that's far, far, far worse uh, to any Catholic, any faithful Catholic or Christian also. Uh, you, well, yes. Never mind. That is, that is the truest statement, I think. Yeah, I wish, if our civilization could learn anything, um, the West today could learn anything that that spiritual death is obviously infinitely worse than physical death. We would, we would, everything would change. I mean, you, you see the stuff that's going on with the coronavirus and everything else. It's like, did we, did we all of a sudden, we just forget that like when we die eternity and I'm specifically talking about Christians, like there's an eternity after we die, mm-hmm. you know, like, are we willing to forfeit all, everything that, we supposedly believe in Mm -hmm. for our physical lives that that doesn't seem like a good trade-off to me so um you know it's it's a very interesting situation we find ourselves in you know i when i used to talk to my students it was like prior to penicillin death was a real part of life but again we have the luxury of living without having to face our mortality on on a daily basis and i'll tell you like my reversion is specifically because I came to face to face with more mortality and all of a sudden I had to start asking important questions in my life. Like if I die, what happens? You know, these are questions that we think about oh, when I'm 80, I'll figure that out. <laughs> but God, that's not how God made yeah. that and set it up that your life is meant to be that continuous. Like you said earlier in this interview that, that I very much believe that we need to give people space to grow in the truth. Like, if we, if we hold people accountable to what we know and not what, what they understand about who God is, you know, it's very easy to judge other people, but, but we need to have people that are actually pursuing the truth. Mm -hmm. That's why I love what you're doing is like, like that's, that, that is the conversation of our generation is the pursuit of truth. Like, you know, just understanding what's true and, and how to live that out in our daily lives. It's very important. It's very, very important. Well, I appreciate the, uh, the, props and the feedback there um i hope that people are getting closer and closer to the truth and i feel i feel like i've definitely learned a lot over the last couple years of doing this but Mm -hmm. why don't uh you let people know where they can find you and where they can yeah just uh yeah so um it's pretty simple you go on youtube and you type in catholic history show it probably will pop up you'll see it's a little flame um icon it's i got like uh, I'm not at 400 subscribers yet, but I'm getting there. We're getting close. Probably the next couple months, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, and I try to. I haven't posted a video in a little while because I'm working on something else right now. Um, but yeah, I'd love to love to connect with anybody on uh, on on YouTube, and um, you leave a comment. I try to get back to you. Um, you know, even negative ones, I'll get back to you. Uh, and uh, yeah. I love love for people to check it out. Catholic History Show at YouTube. Awesome. On YouTube. Yep. And on Twitter, you're at Crucio. Oh, oh. Crucius Wood. Yeah, sorry. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Crucius Wood. Um, yep. That's what I'm working on. Anyways, doesn't matter. But yeah, if you awesome. find me on Twitter, I'm at Crucius Wood. Yep. So. Sweet. And I'll definitely be linking up to all that in the show notes. And um, yeah, and definitely thank you for coming on today, Brendan. I really appreciate it. I think this was a lot of fun. I know yeah. I definitely learned a lot, and I hope everyone <laughs> listening too. No, thank you so much for having me. It was a very pleasure. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Conversation for Our Generation. I hope you got a lot out of it. If you did, definitely go and check out the Catholic History Show. Follow Brendan on Twitter on Catholic at, at Crucewood C R U C I S W O O D. Again, links will be in the show notes for you to check out go check out his YouTube channel as well and subscribe and subscribe to the Conversation for Our Generation YouTube channel too while you're there if you're not already and 
thank you for listening to this episode. I recommend if you are enjoying these, let me know if you see other people out there who are doing interesting stuff and you want me to talk to them, point them out to me, let me know on Twitter, Facebook, you know, contact form on my website, just conversationforgeneration.com slash contact. I'm always looking for some great stuff. I have another interview coming up next week that I think will be really entertaining and interesting. And I'm going to be guest spot on uh, some other podcasts as well coming up soon, including talking to the Vital Masculinity guys. So it's always fun to have a conversation with them. And yeah, just keep keep those coming. Keep Keep listening. Keep letting me know, giving me feedback. I really appreciate all the feedback I've gotten so far. And I'm just looking to figure out ways to make this a better show for you. So let me know there. And as always, thank you for listening to this episode of The Conversation for Our Generation. Let's get the dialogue going. Talk to you next time.